all right so hello guys let us begin with a very simple scenario okay so we have some scenario over here the scenario looks like this so let us take pick two people so we have uh, ruchika in the chat and we have akshit right so let us say that we have two people ruchika and akshit right now both of uh, both of these people ruchika and akshit they created an algorithm for sorting right they created a sorting algorithm and the challenge is that whoever's sorting algorithm runs faster that person will win the contest okay and they will get some prize is that fine cool now uh, ruchika and uh, akshit both test their program and here are the results right so ruchika uses an algorithm called ruchika sort ruchika sort and we we benchmark that algorithm and it turns out that ruchika sort takes 5 seconds to run okay on the other hand akshit uses akshit uses his own algorithm so akshit's algorithm akshit's algorithm and akshit's algorithm takes uh, around 10 seconds or 20 seconds to run okay cool so who do you think wins in this particular contest who do you think has a better algorithm has a faster algorithm is ruchika sort better or is akshit sort better well it, it seems like ruchika is the winner over here right it seems like ruchika is the winner over here because her algorithm runs in only 5 seconds whereas akshit's algorithm takes 20 seconds but hey but akshit says wait 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 this is not fair right ruchika was running her algorithm on a top of the line macbook pro right ruchika was running her algorithm on a top of the line macbook pro whereas akshit was running her, his algorithm on his mobile phone right so it is obvious that hey ruchika's algorithm will run a little faster because she was running it on a better computer so we said okay that's fair enough let us try to run both the algorithms on the same macbook pro okay so ruchika's algorithm takes 5 seconds once again but akshit's algorithm now takes only 1 second yes so when we ran akshit's algorithm on the mac pro it took only 1 second now who is the winner is it ruchika or is it akshit well now that we have now that we have standardized the underlying uh, underlying hardware now it makes us that akshit is the winner right but we are not done yet we we were trying to declare akshit as the winner but ruchika said once again that hey let's let's just wait a second we are trying to run this algorithm to sort 1000 different items okay we were sorting 1000 different items using this algorithm ruchika said that instead of using instead of sorting 1000 elements if you instead sorted 1 million elements right if you instead sorted 1 million items then ruchika claims that her algorithm will run faster right now that that sounds a little weird that i mean for 1000 items ruchika's algorithm is slow but for 1 million items ruchika's algorithm will be faster but that totally happens right depending on the complexity of that algorithm that can totally happen so i hope that you can understand from this particular scenario that analyzing the time complexities of different algorithms is not that simple right we cannot simply measure the time we have to do a lot more lot more careful analysis is that clear so we have to do some sort of a careful analysis all right so here are the things that we need so we want a way we want a way that takes the following into account so number 1 it standardizes it standardizes the underlying hardware the underlying hardware right so we want to make sure that whenever we are testing two algorithms they are running kind of on the same hardware or basically what we want to say is running on a faster computer running on a faster computer should not change who the winner is does that make sense yes so just because we are some algorithm is running on a slow computer some algorithm is running on a faster computer that should not change who the winner is right the second requirement would be programming style it could be that ruchika is a very very good coder and she knows how to uh, perform that coding uh, how to optimize her program a lot right whereas it could be that akshit is not akshit is kind of a beginner and akshit does not know how to optimize the cache uh, maybe and how to how to write the program so that it is very very efficient right so we have to make sure that while comparing algorithms we do not compare the programming styles we do not compare the underlying hardware and finally we have to make sure that we are testing with large enough data large enough input right so just because for a smaller set of for a smaller set of inputs ruchika's algorithm ran slower that does not mean that ruchika's algorithm is in fact slower right we have to test it for a very very large input so we are trying to come up with a way of analyzing algorithms that satisfies all these three criteria 
Is that clear? And the way we do that is by talking about, instead of talking about the time it took to execute, instead of talking about the time it took to execute, we instead talk about the rate of growth of the algorithm, right? Or we talk about the time complexity, complexity of the algorithm. Is that clear guys? Yes. Perfect. So let us see how we model this in a mathematical manner. Okay. So let us, let us take a few more examples before we move on to the mathematical uh, definition, right? Let us suppose that we have two functions. Okay. We have two functions. One of the functions is, let us suppose log x, log x. So what does the graph of log x look like? Can someone tell me what the graph of log x looks like? So the graph of log x looks something like this, right? Log of zero is not defined. Log of one is zero. And as uh, as x increases, the, the value of log x increases monotonically, right? but it increases slowly. This is the graph of log x. Let us look at another function. Let us look at say x equals to 10, right? So what will the graph of x equals to 10 look like? Well, it will look like something like this. It will look something like this. Yes. So what do you think? Which function is larger? Which function looks larger? Is x equal to 10 larger than log x? Does that make sense? Well, on the graph, we can see that it is certainly above log x, but that is not, that is not perfectly right. Okay. So the thing is that as we keep on increasing the value of x, right, as we keep on increasing the value of x, there will be a certain point. There will be a certain point, which will be, let's say x is around, let's say 2000. After which this log x, this log x line, the graph of log x will eventually cross the graph of x equals to 10. Oh, sorry, uh, not x equals to 10, y equals to 10, my bad. Y equals to 10, y equals to 10, right? Does that make sense, guys? So eventually what will happen is the graph of y equals to 10, this graph will become less than the graph of y equals to log x. Yes. Now, why does that happen? Why does that happen? That happens because we are talking about the rate of growth of two functions, right? This particular function, y equals to 10, this function does not grow at all. 10 is a constant, right? Is everyone aware what a constant is? y equals to 10 in that 10 is a constant. Whereas when y equals to log x, when y equals to log x, this log x, this is not a constant. It will grow with the with increasing values of x. It will continue growing and growing, right? So we, when we are comparing the time complexities of different algorithms, we do not want to compare the runtime, the, the time it took for one particular instance. We want to compare how the, the function grows. All right. Let us look at one more example. Let us suppose that we have this graph once again. So we have log X that looks like this and we have Y equals to X by hundred, right? So Y equals to X by hundred will look something like this. Y equals to X by hundred, right? So now, which one do you think is the faster algorithm? Which algorithm do you think is better? Well, currently in the, in this particular part, till this particular point, y equals to x by 100. This was larger than log x, right? However, from this point, from this point onwards, log x was actually greater than y equals to x by 100. Yes. So should we say that log x is slower? Log x takes more time. Should we say that? Well, not necessarily. If we keep on, if we keep on increasing the value of X, what we will encounter is that log X grows much more slowly. Whereas the graph of Y equals to X by hundred that eventually crosses the line of log X. All right. So Y, so eventually for very large X, large X, we will always find that X by hundred will be larger than log X. Now the challenge here is that we have to choose sufficiently large X, right? We can't talk about small values. We have to choose a large enough value of X. Does that make sense? Right? Yes. Cool. Now let us, let us ask a couple more questions. If I take this, if I take this X equals to hundred graphs, right? And if I compare it with log X, instead of comparing this X equals to hundred or uh, Y equals to X by hundred graphs, if I multiply this with some particular constant, Right. If I say that instead of comparing X by hundred versus log X, what if I compare uh, 1000, 1000 times X by hundred, right? Times X by hundred versus log X. Is that going to change which algorithm is faster or which algorithm is slow? Yes or no? By multiplying a particular function by some amount is, should that change 
if an algorithm is faster or slow well that should not change the winner of the algorithms right why should that not change because this is like this is like running it this is like running the program on faster hardware right multiplying this value x by 100 x by 100 by a constant amount 1000 this is like running that same program on a faster hardware so we, we already wanted a method we want a method in which change in hardware does not really affect our winner right irrespective of which hardware we run the program on the winner remains the same so this should not affect the value similarly if instead of multiplying with a constant if i add a constant right if i add a constant this also should not change the winner of my contest right this should not change the ordering of my algorithms is that clear and the way we talk about this mathematically the way we talk about this mathematically is called the asymptotic asymptotic notation right now you will come across a lot of different asymptotic notations the most common being the big o notation the big o notation uh, designated by something like o of fn right then there is the omega notation this is designated by this symbol and we have the theta notation which is this right so we will be talking about in details about what each of these different notations and each of these different methods mean is that clear any any doubts till now repeat the hardware part okay so basically what i am saying is let us say that we have two algorithms a and b right let's say that a took t seconds to complete while b took m seconds to complete right now if i measure if i measure which algorithm is better based on the time it took to complete that measurement is not a very good measurement why because it could be the case that i could be running a on faster hardware and b on slower hardware right or it could be the case that a genius programmer coded a while a new programmer a newbie programmer coded b right so we want a way that abstracts out these differences we want a way that does not care about the underlying hardware we want a way that does not care about the underlying implementation right which is why we want a method that makes sure that the rate of growth of algorithms is compared rather than the time it took all right okay so now let us look at the definitions of these asymptotic notations cool. so first of all let's look at big o right big o notation this is denoted as o of f n so let us let us first write the mathematical definition of this and then i will explain what this means so big o of f n is actually defined as a set of functions functions that grow at most as fast as f of n does that make sense so we are saying that any function whatsoever if that function grows at most as fast as f of n then that function is part of big o of f n right mathematically mathematically so we will talk about the rate of growth mathematically we will denote this as big o of f n is the set of all functions g n right big o of f n is the set of all the functions g n such that the function grows at most as fast as f n how do we denote this how do we denote this mathematically how do we denote the rate of growth mathematically all right so let us look at how do we denote the rate of growth mathematically so first of all we want to make sure that the multiplicative constants the underlying hardware does not really affect right the underlying hardware does not really affect it so we are going to say that okay gn gn must be less than or equal to fn but we can allow for some multiplicative constant we can allow you to multiply any constant c over here all right so we are saying that for any constant c for some constant c right there exists a constant c there exists a constant c such that this holds right that's the first thing we do not want multiplicative factors to affect our rate of growth secondly we want to make sure that we are measuring for a large enough input right we do not care about small inputs so we will put another constraint over here we will say that this will hold true this will hold true for all n which are greater than some value of n right which are greater than some base value now we are not defining what this base value is we are saying that it should be just greater than some particular value after this value no matter what value of n you choose as long as you have some constant and your value is greater than n0 then gn will remain less than or equal to fn does that make sense yes this is how we define grows at most as fast as fn basically 
let us suppose that this function is fn right and let us suppose that this function is gn now we want to define we want to check if gn is a part of big o of fn right so we are going to say that all right let us first let us first not talk about small values of n right let us not talk about small values of n let us define a very big value n0 let us define a very big value n0 and we will only be considering we will only be considering all the values of n that are greater than n0 we will only be talking about this part in this part in this part it could be the case that gn is above fn or gn is below fn however if i am allowed to multiply fn with a constant c if i am allowed to multiply fn with a constant c which is greater than 0 and i can make sure that by doing that fn is always above gn right if by multiplying fn by a constant by constant c i can make fn always above gn then i can say that fn grows at least as fast as gn or i can say that gn is in big o of fn does that make sense yes so once again once again big o of fn is the set of all functions that grow at most as fast as fn right mathematically is it is defined as the set of all functions gn such that there exists a constant c which is greater than 0 and for all n is greater than n not right for, for whenever these constraints are satisfied then gn must be less than or equal to c times f of n this is how we this is how we mathematically represent this statement all right these two statements are completely equivalent cool now let me let me take some questions let me take some uh, simple questions so let us suppose that we have uh, fn equals to n plus 6 all right this is one function fn equals to n plus 6 let us try to list down let us try to list down what big o of fn is right so can someone can someone try to guess what big o of fn is going to be can someone try to give me an answer over here sumit asks do we know do we need to know this part to calculate the complexities of in our program yes sumit uh, understanding understanding the meaning of big o notation and understanding the meaning of asymptotic notations asymptotic complexities is very important right if you do not really understand that part then you might end up at incorrect answers and you will not understand why your answer is incorrect cool so what all functions do you think are part of big o of fn well of course y equals to n is definitely a part right so basically f of n f of n equals to n is it it is slower than n plus 6 does that make sense well what about uh, fn equals to n by 100 is that also big, uh, a part of big o of fn yes that is a part of big o of fn what about fn equals to 100 n plus 600 well it seems that 100 n plus 600 is greater than n plus 6 Right? It seems that 100 n plus 600 is greater than n plus 6. But please remember that we have this constant that we are allowed to use. That right? we are allowed to multiply f n with a constant. So this is also allowed because we can simply multiply f n. We can multiply f n with a constant like 1000, right? And then 100 plus 600, 100 n plus 600 will be less than 1000 n plus 6000, right? So this is definitely a part. Well, there are a lot of other functions that are also part of big O of f n. For example, f n. Equals to or let me let me call these gns right let me call these gns gn equals to log of n log of n also grows slower than n plus six so this is also part of big O of f n right similarly under root of n right similarly uh, log n to the power five all these functions are part of big O of f n in fact this set is infinitely large in fact this set is infinitely large right there are infinitely many functions that are part of this set is that clear yes. perfect okay so now that we understand what the big o complexity means let us quickly look at let us quickly look at the the order in which we basically we know that uh, let let us look at some rules of big o complexity okay so let us let us compare the following things so we have a constant we have a constant function this is represented as fn equals to some constant c all right on the other hand we can have some sort of a logarithm logarithm right this is represented as fn equals to log base log of n right with some base b right with some base b okay we could have a poly, we could have a, a square root square root right this would look like fn equals to under root of n 
we could have more. We could have something like uh, linear. Okay, this will look like f n equals to n. We can have quadratic. Right, f n equals to n square plus ten maybe. Right, and so on and so forth. Right, so we can have cubic. We can have uh, we can have any polynomial with any degree. Right, then on a high level we can even have exponential. We can even have exponential. So this will look like f n equals to two to the power n. Right, f n equals to two to the power n, or f n equals to one point five to the power n. Whenever the base, whenever the base is greater than one, then it is exponential. Right, cool. Then is that is that is exponential the highest complexity that we can talk about? Certainly not. We can we can keep going. Right, so we can define something like factorial maybe. We can define factorial. So this would be f n equals to n factorial maybe. Right, we could have even so we could have lesser exponential. So we could have f n. Equals to n to the power n, right? We can have, we can have, we can continue infinitely. We can continue infinitely both in this direction and in this direction, right? Can something be slower than a constant though? So not in not in this direction, but over here. Can something be slower than a constant? No, right? Because a constant literally does not grow. A constant does not grow at all. So the constant is the least amount of growth that is possibly that is possible, right? But there are functions that can lie between this and this. Does that make sense? So this is the this is the increase. This is in increasing order. Is that clear, guys? This is an increasing order of the complexity. Constant grows the slowest. It grows the slowest. So if a function grows slower, what does it mean? What does it mean? Is the algorithm faster or slower? So if there is an algorithm that takes this much time, and we are saying this function grows very very slowly. Right. In fact, this function does not grow at all; grows slowly. So, what can I say about the algorithm? Is the algorithm fast or is the algorithm slow? Right. So, when the when the complexity grows slowly, the algorithm is fast. Algo is fast. Right. Whereas when the complexity complexity grows quickly, quickly the algorithm is slow. All right. So, we want our algorithm. We want our algorithm to have a complexity that grows very, very slowly. Does that make sense? So an algorithm that runs in constant time, that algorithm is the fastest algorithm. An algorithm that runs in logarithm time, that algorithm is pretty fast, right? An algorithm that runs in factorial time, that algorithm is extremely, extremely slow. Is that clear? Yes. Cool. So let me let me ask you a couple of questions. Of course, you will find many more questions. Uh, so i mean i will be giving you a couple of questions over here but if you want to practice more questions you will find the link in the video description right so in the youtube video description you can go and there will be a link to a set of questions over there just go over there and try those questions out all right so i mean i i hope that you understand this distinction between active learning and passive learning right if you just watch a lecture like a movie right if you just listen to that lecture you do not take notes and you do not practice then you will be you will you will be getting some of the benefit but you won't be getting all of the benefit right on the other hand when you actually take notes when you actually write your notes yourself and once the lecture is over once when you actually practice the problems that is going to help you out a lot cool so this was a lot of theoretical stuff right this was a lot of theoretical stuff about what asymptotic notations are now let us actually look at some code let us actually look at some code and try to see if we can figure out what the asymptotic complexity of that code is. All right. Now, figuring out the asymptotic complexity of a particular piece of code can be very, very difficult, right? So, for example, if you have a recursive function, recursive function, or if you have a complex data structure, complex data structure, right? Then analyzing the time complexity of that piece of code can become a little more difficult. So we will not be covering this today, all right. However, we will be taking a class. We will have a complete set of classes on recursion, right? We will have a set of classes on recursion. We will have a set of classes on different data structures as well. So when we talk about recursion, we will talk about the we will talk about analyzing the time complexity of recursion as well in that particular session, all right. Today we are only going to look at very simple pieces of code and trying to analyze the complexities of those pieces of code. Cool. So let us let us begin. Let us begin. So suppose I have written a program that looks something like this. I declare a variable int x equals to 10, right? And then I do something with, maybe I do print x, right? Let us suppose this is my piece of code. How much time do you think this code takes? How much time does this code take? How much time do you think this code takes? 
Well, whenever we have trivial operations like this, whenever we have trivial or simple operations, then usually those operations take a constant amount of time, right? A constant amount of time. So this particular operation, this is a declaration, declaration, and there is also an initialization, right? So what will happen is the, the computer will allocate some memory. The computer will populate that memory with the value 10 and the computer will move a lot of stuff in and out of the CPU, in and out of the RAM, in and out of the cache and things like that, right? Similarly, when they are, we are calling the print function, what will happen is the computer will load the address of X, right? It will load the address of X. It will load the address of this print function, right? And then it will invoke this print function with this particular address, right? Whatever this print function does, it will also do that. So we are assuming over here that all these operations, these operations take a constant time each, right? So this one takes O1 time, this one takes O1 time, all right? So overall, this entire program takes a constant amount of time. Is that clear? Very simple, very easy thing, right? But this is not that simple, right? We have to be a little more careful. For example, for example, let us say that I have, instead of x equals to 10, I have a vector of it, right? So vector of int is just a list of it. So uh, if you are coming from a programming language like Python, so this is in C++, in Python, you would just have uh, x equals to list of something, right? In uh, Java, maybe you will have x equals to array list, right? Array list of integers and so on, right? Let us suppose that we have a vector of int. So we are saying x equals to vector of int and it has, let's say, a size of 1000 elements, right? 1000 elements. Right? Or let us say that it has a size of n. It has a size of n. What if I try to do something like this? Print x. How much time do you think this print x will take now? How much time do you think this print x will take now? Well, earlier we said that print x was going to take a constant amount of time, right? But now it will not take a constant amount of time because in order to print a large, large array, it will have to go through that entire array, right? It will have to go through that entire array. So whenever we are talking about very simple data structures, whenever we are talking about the basic data types, right? Like integers, like floats, then the operations on them will be constant amount of time. But when we have larger data structures, for example, when we have vectors or when we have hash maps, right, then operations on them can take more time. So for example, in this case, the print function will take order of n time. It will be linear. Does that make sense? So we have to be careful over here. We have to be careful before we, uh, before we simply say that, okay, this is constant time. We have to be a little more careful. Okay, so now let us move on to some more or uh, some control flow structures, all right? Suppose that we have code that looks like this. Uh, if condition, if condition, right? And if this is the condition, then we do some do some work over here that is, that takes O of Fn time. Else, we do some work over here that takes O of Gn time, right? So basically we are saying that if this condition is true, we will go into this part, we'll go into this block, and the time complexity of this block is order of fn, right? Whereas if this condition is not true, we'll go into this block and the time complexity of this block is order of g. So if this is the case, then what is the time complexity of this overall piece of code? What is the time complexity of this overall piece of code? Well, the time complexity of this overall piece of code is, it is the maximum, maximum out of fn comma gn, right? So you will, you will basically say that this is order of max of fn comma gn is that clear cool alternatively you could have also said that this is order of fn plus gn right even though even though depending on this condition you will only go into one of these blocks right it is not the case that you're going into both these blocks however asymptotically this and this they are exactly the same why are they the same can somebody tell me that because these are related by a constant factor Right? These are related by a constant factor. If I just multiply this, if I just multiply this value by two times, right? If I just multiply this value by two times, then this value, two times this maximum value will become greater than fn plus gn, right? Which is why it doesn't really matter which one we say. Is that clear? Cool. Now let us move on to loops, for example. All right. So we, we just covered if else statements. They, they are a part of control flow. Let us move on to loops. So let us suppose that we have a for loop, something like this i equals to zero, i less than n, i plus plus, right? And in this loop, let us say we are doing a print i. Yes. 
so whenever we are talking about loops we have to we have to look at the time complexity in different parts okay so first of all we will say what is the time complexity of this inside block what is the time complexity of this inside block well this is constant right printing a particular value it takes just one step right so this inside block is constant then we will see okay how many times how many times are we going to run this inside block so this inside block although it takes a constant amount of time it is not going to be run once right we are going to run this again and again how many times are we going to run this well how many times this loop will run right so that will that is how much this loop goes from 0 all the way till n minus 1 so that is n times yes that is n times so it turns out that the complexity of this entire program the complexity of this entire program is n times order of 1 right n times order of 1 which is nothing but order of n is that clear cool let us look at let us look at nested loops so nested loops are very similar so suppose that we have for i goes from 0 i less than n i plus plus right and we have suppose j as well so we have a nested loop inside this for j goes from 0 j less than let's say n j plus plus right and over here we do print suppose i plus j right suppose this is our code then once again we will look at the innermost block we will look at the innermost block and we will say okay how many what is the time complexity of this block right what is the time complexity of this block well the time complexity of this block is just order of 1 because we are printing an integer right we are printing a single integer so the time complexity is just order of 1 then we will ask ourselves okay how many times are we going to run this block how many times are we going to run this block well the answer is not so simple right the answer is not so simple because these both the loops both these loops are going to run this block again and again so let us break it down further let us say that okay let us not let us not worry about the outside loop let us not worry about the outside loop let us look at this piece of code right let us look at this piece of code what is the time complexity of this piece of code well we just saw it earlier right the time complexity of this piece of code is order of n this is order of n why it is order of n because we are running this oven operation n times right this loop will run n times so this this time complexity is order of n then we will say okay now this this blue block this blue block here takes order of n time and we are going to run this blue block n times right so what is the overall time complexity it is n times big o of n which is big o of n square is that clear right so i i hope that you now understand how to calculate the time complexities of nested nested loops all right now we have to be a little more careful once again in this particular loop why was this loop taking order of n time so if we have a loop that looks like this for i equals to 0 i less than n i plus plus we say that this loop ran n times does everyone agree that this loop ran n times yes what about if we had a loop that looks something like this for i equals to 0 i less than n i plus equals to 2 right instead of incrementing by 1 what if we incremented by 2 or what if we incremented by 200 now the loop will not run n times right now how many times will the loop run if this is the case then how many times will the loop run it will run n by 200 times yes n by 200 times well let us look at the time complexity in that case let us say that inside this we were doing oven work right inside both these things we were doing oven work so the time complexity of the previous block was n times order of 1 which was order of n the time complexity of this block is what it is n by 200 times order of 1 which is what which is order of n by 200 well order of 2 n by 200 is actually the same as order of n is that clear the order of n by 200 the big o of n by 200 is actually the same as big o of n right because as we said in the big o time complexity in the asymptotic notations we kind of ignore the constant multiplicative factors right any constant multiplicative or additive factors can be ignored is that clear yes cool so basic no no these are separate loops guys these are separate loops these are two different pieces of code we are saying what happens when we do i plus plus whereas what or compared to that what happens when we do i plus equals to 200 all right this loop will run n times this loop will run n by 200 times these are different pieces of code right they are not nested loops okay these are not nested loops yes so yes there is true it is true that this this particular loop this loop runs 200 times less right this this loop runs only n by 200 times whereas this loop runs n times 
but the time complexity asymptotic time complexity of both the loops is the same is that clear okay so saurav has a question over here saurav says that okay when we did this if else condition thing you told us the following you told us that big o of fn plus gn is the same as big o of max of fn comma gn right this is what i said let us try to prove why this is the case okay let us try to prove why this is the case all right so let us go to the definition of big o once again right let us go to the definition of big o once again let us let us look at this particular part over here right let us look at this particular part so i am going to prove i am going to prove that for large enough n right when when the value of n0 is large enough and for some constant c for some constant c i am going to prove the following fn plus gn is less than or equal to c times max of fn comma gn right and this will be for all n greater than n0 yes if i can prove this if i can prove this then what will that mean that will mean that fn plus gn is actually an element of big of max of fn comma gn is that clear does that make sense cool so let us see let us see if this is true or not let us see if this is true or not well let us fix n not let us say n not equals to 0 okay let us say that n not equals to 0 so we are we are having a very small value of n not that does not matter let us let us now choose a value of c let us say that c equals to 2 Okay, let us say that c equals to two. Well, if c equals to two, then does this equation hold? F n plus g n is less than equal to two times max of f n comma g n. Is this equation true? Is this equation true? Yes, this is true. Why is this true? Well, we don't really know what is larger. What is larger between f n and g n? But let us suppose that f n is larger. Right? Let us suppose that f n is larger. So what will this be? This will be two times f n. Minus some delta value because g n is smaller than f n, whereas on the right hand side we have two times the maximum of f n and g n will be f n itself. So that will be two times f of n. So we see that yes, this this equation in fact holds, right? Which is why we can say that f n plus g n is is an element of big O of max of f n comma g n, right? Similarly, we can do this the other way around as well. We can also prove that max of f n comma g n this is in fact less than or equal to some c2 times f n plus g n for some larger of value value of n right so we can prove this the other way around as well so that will mean that this does not just this go one way right this is true but also this is true max of f n comma g n is is an element of big o of f n plus g n right so this is also true and if we if we put these both together if we put this both together we see that hey irrespective of what function i choose i can say that this function grows faster than this function right if i am telling you that x is less than y x is less than equal to y and i also tell you that y is less than equal to x what does that mean if i have both these equations what does that really mean it means that x is just the same as y yes is that clear so over here we can say that f of n plus g of n is the same as max of fn comma gn right but this is not correct right this is not correct we have to be careful we do not mean equals to over here right we do not mean equals to over here. clearly these two functions are not we mean the order of growth right we mean the order of growth is equal right now this equation is correct is that clear yes perfect cool so let us look at one more one more for loop for example so suppose we have a for loop that looks something like this so we have for i goes from 0 i less than n i multiplication equals to 2 right then print i how much time do you think this particular loop will take well let us let us look at what happens in this loop right what happens in this loop so initially so let let us start with i equals to 1 in fact let us start with i equals to 1 right so initially i equals to 1 right then we will print i print 1 Then what will happen? I will be multiplied by two. So I becomes two. So we will print two. After that, I becomes four. Then I becomes eight. Then I becomes sixteen, and so on and so forth. Right. So I is doubling each and every time. Right. I is doubling each and every time. So if I has to reach n, right? How many steps will it take 
to reach n that is the question if i keeps doubling each and every time how many steps will it take to reach n that is the question will it take n time n steps will it take under root of n steps will it take n by 2 steps will it take log n steps what do you think is the answer well this is the answer right it will actually take log of n base 2 steps right it will take log of n base 2 steps is everyone familiar with this right this is via the definition of log n right i hope that everyone is familiar with this if you are not if you are not super comfortable with this not a problem just just join the discussion right in the chat there will be a link for the discussion just join over there and we can i can explain that to you in much more detail why this is going to take log n steps all right cool so this particular loop this particular piece of code this takes order of one time and we are going to do that log n times so the complexity of this code is overall going to be order of log of n is that clear yes perfect let us look at another example maybe let us say that we have a uh, for i equals to let us say 1 right and we can say that okay let us let us have j is less than n i plus plus okay so please note over here let let's not let's not make it j let us say that this is k let us say that this is k so we are going from i equals to 1 we are incrementing i and we are checking the condition with respect to k and inside the loop we will write k equals to k plus i is that clear is this program clear initially k equals to 0 and we are going from k equals to 0 all the way till k equals to n and this is the program so let us see what will happen let us see what will happen so how much time is this inner part going to take what is the time complexity of this inner part well very simple once again this is just order of one time right this just takes order of one time but how many times are we going to execute this right how many times is this code going to run is this loop going to run uh, let us try to analyze that right so initially k is 0 and i is 1 right initially k is 0 and i is 1 so when we do this k will become 1 right when we do this k will become 1 okay then what happens in the next step what happens in the next step we go to this thing right i plus plus so i becomes 2 now i becomes 2 now right so when i becomes 2 what will k become what will k become k will become so k was earlier 1 plus 2 which will now be 3 right so k equals to 3 yes does that make sense let us look at the next step let us look at the next step so now i equals to 3 k will become 1 plus 2 plus 3 right 1 plus 2 plus 3 which will be actually equal to 6 right so we will print k equals to 6 and so on and so forth so how much time how much time do you think it will take for k to reach n right how many steps will it take how many steps will it take so after the first step so after the first step k was 1 after the second step k was 3 after the third step k was 6 after the fourth step k will be 10 and so on and so forth so after how many steps after how many steps will k be greater than or equal to n that is the question right what is the delta here the delta here keeps changing right the delta here keeps changing initially it was 1 then it became 2 then it became 3 then it became 4 and so on it will keep on increasing right so that is the question so can someone tell me the answer when we will have to we will have to do some mathematics over here right we will have to do some mathematics over here so basically what is happening with k is at the ith step at the ith step the value of k is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way till i do you guys agree at the ith step this is the value of k yes because that is what we are doing right we are incrementing the value of i and we are adding it to k every time so at the ith step this is the value of k all right so let us let us try to solve this so do you guys know this do you guys know the the formula for this what is the value of 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way till n right with you can also write this as the summation for i equals to 1 till n of i right this is the sum of sum of first n natural numbers can someone tell me the formula this this is simply the same as n into n plus 1 by 2 right this is also known as the nth triangular triangular number this is also the same as n plus 1 choose 2 right you can represent the same thing in multiple multiple ways in mathematics you can say you can say it like this 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 and you can say it like this all right so many different ways okay so now that we know this formula 
now that we know this formula what we are basically saying is that at ith step at ith step k equals to 1 plus 2 plus all the way till i which is nothing but i times i plus 1 by 2 right that is what we are saying at the ith step k will have this value right now our question is at what step at what step will k be greater than equal to n right that is the question is this clear so we have an equation to solve right so we are basically saying if at the ith step k is this then at what step will k be greater than equal to n so let us simply place the value right we want i times i plus 1 by 2 to be greater than or equal to n yes i plus i into i plus 1 by 2 is greater than or equal to n right so basically i uh, into i plus 1 is greater than or equal to 2n right and if we solve this if we make it in terms of i right if we make it in terms of i so remember what we have to find we have to find the value of i because we want which step how many steps does it take so it will turn out that i will come out to be will come out to be of the form square root of n right it won't be exactly square root of n it will have some particular value over there but the effective will be that i will be order of square root of n is that clear yes yes how do you actually solve for i from this how do you actually solve for i from this so you can make it into a quadratic equation right so you can say i square plus i is greater than equal to 2n then you can say i square plus i minus 2n is greater than equal to 0 then you can solve it with the minus so minus b plus minus root over of b square minus 4ac by 2a right you can put the value of b the value of a and the value of c to find the final value and it will turn out that i will be of some form of root n so i is the order of root n so what we are essentially saying is what we are essentially saying is that the loop the loop will run order of root n times yes the loop will run order of root n times and how much how much work are we doing in every single iteration in every single iteration we are doing a constant amount of work right in every single iteration we are doing a constant amount of work so overall time complexity overall time complexity will be order of root n times order of 1 which is nothing but order of root n all right so the time complexity of this particular function will be this particular loop will be order of root n okay cool so i guess we will end the lecture for this today so this was today was very simple concepts the very very basics of time complexity very simple loops very simple if else statements right uh, we are going to cover a lot of things in a lot of depth right so we will when we will have the class on recursion we will tell you how to understand how to analyze the time complexity of recursion when we talk about sorting we will consider the time complexity of sorting when we talk about graphs and trees we will talk about the time complexity analysis for graphs and trees all right so do not worry about that Cool. All right then, guys. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Hello, guys. So today we are going to discuss another sorting algorithm that is bubble sort. Right. So what bubble sort says that if you are given any unsorted sequence of integers, so what bubble sort algorithm will do? It will just try to bubble up the largest possible number in the whole unsorted sequence. Right. So here you can see that currently in this unsorted sequence. 5 is going to be the largest number so what bubble sort will do bubble sort will try to just place this largest number from the unsorted sequence to its best possible position right so it will just place it to the best possible position so what bubble sort will ensure that after each iteration whatever the unsorted part is left we will just make sure that the maximum of that unsorted part is going towards its best possible position after every iteration right so it will just bubble up it will just try to make sure that these integers are getting bubble up to the best possible positions in the sorted sequence right so let's see what is the basic intuition behind bubble sort right so suppose that you are given any unsorted sequence suppose you have a unsorted part from a sequence suppose this is a1 a2 till the position am and after that if we start from a m plus 1 a m plus 2 till a n which is a sorted part so this is a sorted region and this is the unsorted region so what we are going to do we will just make sure that inside this sorted part this is going to be the minimum element right inside this sorted part this is going to be the minimum element and say inside this unsorted part we have some element x as the maximum element right so what we will try to ensure that after each iteration whatever the division is we will make sure that this minimum element of this sorted part is every time 
greater than the maximum element of this unsorted part right and what we are going to do at each iteration we will just pick out this maximum element and put it to its best position so if this maximum element is just smaller than this uh, minimum element of the sorted part then what will be the best possible position after the whole sequence is sorted for this maximum element it will be just behind this a m plus 1 element so we will try to just place x here right so at each iteration we will just divide our array into two parts in the initial iterations the whole array will be considered as the unsorted part and the size of the sorted part will be zero and after the complete sorting algorithm has been executed this sorted part will be equal to the size of the array and the size of the unsorted part will become equals to zero right so let us just see how a basic dry run and see that how we can just apply bubble sort in the following case right so suppose the array given to you is 5 4 3 2 1 so here you can see that this array is arranged in the descending order so if it is 5 4 3 2 1 right so at each iteration what we are going to do we will just keep a tracker i as well as a tracker j right we will just keep a tracker j so now what we are ensuring that if the current element which i is pointing if it is greater than the just next adjacent element then we will just swap these two elements right so here you can see 5 and 4 will be swapped and 4 will come here 5 will come here right now i will be incremented i will be incremented let's say just we are just keeping things uh, uh, on a simpler note by keeping just i as our variable now i is pointing to 5 now i will be compared with i plus 1 and index and here you can see that 5 is greater than 3 so again we will just swap things from here to here here so here you can see this is 3 and this is 5 now again 5 will be compared with 2 and here you can see it will again be swapped so 5 will uh, 2 will come here 5 will come here after that 5 will be swapped with 1 so this will be like this sequence right now again we will just start i from the very uh, 0th index that is this one and now here you can see 4 when 4 and 3 will be compared 4 will be greater than 3 so we will just swap 4 and 3 right so 4 and 3 will be swapped and 3 will come here and 4 will come here again 4 and 2 will be swapped so 4 2 will come here and 4 will be swapped to here and again 4 and 1 will be swapped so these two come here so again here you can see that we just picked out 4 as the maximum element from the unsorted part and we just placed 4 at its best position so at each iteration at least one of the element is getting placed at its best possible position now if you compare 3 so here you can see we will start again from i is equals to 0 we will compare i with the next corresponding element so here you can see 3 and 2 will be uh, compared so 2 will come here and 3 will come here again 3 and 1 will be swapped so here you can see 3 and 1 will are going to be swapped so 1 come here comes here and 3 comes here and now if we just compare 3 and 4 so no swapping will occur because 3 is lesser than 4 now at last what will happen is we will just compare 2 and 1 so 1 will come here 2 will come here 2 is also present at its best position and at last 1 is also present at its best position so here you can see that we just uh, at every iteration we were just bubbling up the maximum possible element from the unsorted sequence and we just place this bubble to the sorted part right and at last the size of this sorted part will grow up till the size of the original array right so let us just see that how we can just implement this algorithm so what we are supposed to do we can just try to mimic the same algorithm in the code like we will just have one pointer which will be pointing to the first position right and what we can say is we can just have a variable which can just keep a track on the fact that if we are sometimes swapping an element or not right so here you can see when 5 was present here and 4 was present here you can see that when we were just swapping both the elements we know that swapping will occur only in those times when the some part of the array is unsorted right but if the whole array is already sorted if the whole array is already sorted then obviously no swapping will occur so we can just keep a variable that can just track the fact that if we are swapping some element or not and if in the whole iteration if we are not doing any kind of swapping then obviously the whole sequence is sorted and there is no point of reiterating to the whole sequence again and again right so let us just try to think in this manner only so we will just keep a track on a flag that is suppose we are keeping a flag uh, track on the done flag so initially what we what we can suppose is this done flag is marked as what false right and what we can do is while 
this flag is false, right? While this flag is false, we will just try to implement the algorithm. Now, what the algorithm will say? Suppose at each, at each iteration, I will mark this flag as true, right? I will mark this flag as true. And if at any time, any swapping will occur, I will just change the flag to false again and the loop will be implemented again, right? Now, we will start from i is equals to 0 and what we can do is, while i is less than n minus 1, right? We will just uh, go till the last index and we will just check that if array at i is greater than array at i plus 1, then what we can do is, we can just swap the element present at the ith index with the element present at the i plus 1 index. And as I said that, if any one swapping is also occurring, then also we are at an unsorted uh, sequence and we are supposed to sort the sequence. So, we will just again mark this done variable as false, right? We will just mark this as false. We will just close this if loop uh, if conditional and increment the value of i, right? So here you can see that as soon as we will just come at this while loop, we will just check that if we are greater than our adjacent element and if that is the case, then we will just swap uh, myself and just uh, change the variable of the done, uh, done flag, right? So here you can see that if the sequence is already sorted, suppose that sequence is like 1, 2, 3, 4. So here you can see that the sequence is already sorted. We will start with the done variable as false. We will check that uh, while not done, that is while the value of done is false, we will mark the value of done as true. So we will just mark the value of done as true, right? We will start the variable i is equals to 0. We will check that while i is less than n minus 1, we will check if i is greater than the adjacent element. So here you can see 1 is not greater than the adjacent element. So this if conditional will not be executed, i will be incremented. Now i will become equal to 1. So 2 will be compared to 3. Again, no if conditional check will uh, execute. Now i will become 2. 3 is uh, not uh, greater than 4, 3 is lesser than 4. So again, this conditional will not be executed and we will just come out to the while loop. Now here you can see that after we just came out to the while loop, the value of this done variable is true. So if we will just try to reiterate in this corresponding while loop, then obviously this while loop will terminate. This while loop will terminate as soon as we have got our whole array has sorted. So what happens in the case of bubble sort is if the array is already sorted, right? So no swapping generally occurs and we can just in linear time check that the whole array is getting sorted. But in the worst case, in the worst case, what can happen is we can get an unsorted kind of sequence and in this unsorted kind of sequence every time we are starting from this very first index and going till the last index, right? We can even optimize this approach by not iterating till the, till the last index. Why? Because we know that at the first iteration, the largest number will be present at its best possible position that is last. After the second iteration, the second largest number will be present at its best position that is second last and so on. So we can just reduce the, uh, the searching part, the searching space at every corresponding iteration. But let us say that in the worst case, we are just iterating to all the n sequences. So the number of iteration will lead to the complexity of big O of n square in asymptotic notation while in the best case this is going to be a linear kind of scenario in the best case the bubble sort algorithm will run in linear time that is big O of n right so I hope the logic for the bubble sort algorithm is clear to you all this is one of the very fundamental algorithm in sorting algorithms and this will lay down the concepts of more sorting algorithm for you guys right so I hope you like the lecture and if you have any suggestion you can just put them down in the comment section we will meet in the uh, next video so thank you guys see you next time hello guys so today we are going to discuss one of the very important sorting algorithm that is selection sort right so let us just see what the selection sort algorithm say to sort an unsorted array suppose that this is the given unsorted array that we are supposed to sort so what selection sort says is that at every iteration what we are going to do is just divide the array into two parts such that one part will be completely sorted and one part will be unsorted and at every iteration, what we are going to do from the unsorted array, we are going to find the minimum element and we will place this minimum element at its best position. So let us see how to iterate over this array using the selection sort algorithm. So to implement the selection sort algorithm, what we will do, we will take help of three pointers. So let us just name it as i and we will make one pointer j that will start from i plus 1th position. And we will also take a minimum index, 
point right so at every iteration of i what we will say is this minimum index element will be equal to the element pointed by the ith pointer and then what we will do is just start our iteration in this particular sub array and we will find that if there exists any element which is smaller than the element present at the minimum index and as soon as we will be finding more elements which will be lesser than the element pointed by the minimum index we will just update the minimum index but for the time being we will start the iteration saying that the minimum index element is the element pointed by the ith pointer so here you can see the indexing will be 0 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 right so let's just start so uh, on the initial note the i will be pointing to the 0th element and j will be pointing to the i plus 1th element right so as i earlier said in every iteration i will say that the minimum index element is the element pointed by the ith index so i will mark minimum index element as 0 now what we will do we will start the iteration of j from i plus 1th index to the n minus 1th index and in this sub array we will find the element which is smaller than the element pointed by the minimum index so now here you can see is 2 less than the element pointed by the minimum index which is 17 yes so what we will do is just update the value of the minimum index as 1 and what we will do is just increment the value of the j pointer because there can be more elements which will be still smaller than the element pointed by the minimum index element now j is pointing to 1 so is the element pointed by the jth index smaller than the element pointed by the minimum index and minimum index pointer is pointing to 2 so here you can see j is pointing to much lesser element so we will again update the value of minimum index as 2 and again j will be incremented right so now j will be pointing here and here you can see 9 is not less than 1 because 1 is pointed by the minimum index so we will not update the value of the minimum index and again j will be pointing here so now here you can see 8 is also not less than the element pointed by the uh, minimum index which is 1 again j will be incremented so here you can see j is pointing to 7 and here you can see 7 is also not less than 1 and at last j will be pointing to 13 j will be pointing to 13 and again 13 is not less than 1 so we will stop the iteration of j and now as soon as the loop of j will end what we will have in our hand is the minimum index element and the element at the ith index what we will do is just swap the elements present at the ith index and the element present at the minimum index element so now after swapping 1 will come here and 17 will come here right so here you can see we have just placed 1 at, at its best position now we will increment the value of i i will be pointing here again a new fresh loop will start and minimum index will be initially pointing to the same element pointed by the ith index that is 1 and we will start the j pointer from i plus 1th index now we will compare is the element pointed by the j uh, pointer is smaller than the element pointed by the minimum index so no uh, j is not smaller than this so we will just increment the value of j now j is pointing to 9 uh, is 9 less than the element pointed by the minimum index that is 2 so 9 is not less than 2 again j will be incremented here you can see 8 is also not less than 2 j will be incremented 7 is also not less than 2 again j will be incremented and at last here you can see j is pointing to 13 and 13 is also not less than 2 because 2 is the element pointed by the minimum index so we will just complete the loop and here you can see we will again swap the values pointed by the ith pointer and the minimum index pointer and here you can see the both are pointing to the same element so the array will be uh, remaining at its original position only and we will increment the value of i so here you can see we have also placed 2 at its best position now again minimum index will be equal to 2 i will be pointing to 2 and j will start from i plus 1 so again is 9 less than 17 because 17 is pointed by the minimum index so again yes 9 is less than 17 so we will update the value of minimum index that is 3 now we will increment the value of j so j is pointing to 8 minimum index is pointing to 9 is 8 less than 9 yes 8 is less than 9 we will again update the value of minimum index as 4 now j will be pointing to 7 and minimum index is pointing to 8 so is 7 less than 8 
yes, seven is less than eight. So again, we will update the value of minimum index as five. And at last, J will be pointing to thirteen, but thirteen is not less than seven. So we will do nothing, and the loop of J will be uh, completed. And at last, what we will do? We will swap the elements pointed by the ith pointer and the minimum index pointer. So here. This will be swapped, and seven will come here, and seventeen will come here, right? So again, the loop of i will be incremented. So i will come here. Minimum index will start from three, right? And j will come here, right? So again, is eight less than nine? Yes, eight is less than nine. Minimum index will be four. Now j will be pointing to seventeen. Is seventeen less than eight? No, seventeen is not less than eight. J will be incremented. And at last, J will be at thirteen. So thirteen is also not less than eight. So we will have our minimum index pointer at pointing at element eight, and I is pointing at nine. So we will swap these elements. So this will become eight, and this will become nine, right? So now I will come here. Minimum index will start again from four. Now J will start from seventeen. Is seventeen less than nine? No. J will be incremented. Is thirteen uh, less than nine? No. So J. Will complete its loop and again i and minimum index are pointing to the same element, so no swapping will occur. And even if we just swap the element, the element will be at its original position only. So now i is pointing to element uh, index five, minimum index is also pointing to five, and j will start from here. Now is thirteen less than seventeen? Yes, thirteen is less than seventeen. We will update the value of j. Well, uh, minimum index with the value of j that is six, and j j's loop will be completed, and we will swap the element present at the sixth index and the fifth index. So, so thirty and seventeen will be swapped, and here you can see we have completed the sorting of our array. So as soon as i reaches the n minus second index and completes its procedure, our whole array will be sorted. Right. So let us write the pseudo code for the following algorithm. So the pseudo code will be pretty easy for this algorithm. What we will do is just start our loop of i from zero and iterate i till i is less than n minus one. That is the instance when i will reach the n minus second index, right? And we will increment the value of i. We will keep a minimum index pointer starting from the value of i at every iteration, and then we will start a loop of j starting from i plus one. J will go go up to J less than n and J plus plus. Then what we will do? We will compare that if array at minimum index is greater than array at J, we will update the value of minimum index. So here you can see minimum index will become equals to J, right? And as soon as the uh, for loop of J will be completed, we will just swap the values of the ith index as well as the Minimum index. So by following this particular algorithm, you will be able to implement the selection sort algorithm. So here you can see the selection sort algorithm is uh, pretty easy to implement. And talking about the time complexity of the selection sort algorithm, so here you can see that starting from the very first index, we are initially making n minus one iterations, then n minus two iterations, and so on, right? Till the time when we will do, do just one iteration, so the sum of these terms will be n into n minus one by two, and in asymptotic big O notation, this will lead to big O of n square time complexity, right? So selection sort has a very uh, intuitive and a very simple algorithm, right? And it has a very imp important application also in uh, modern computer science because suppose that you have a, a lot of data in your hard disk, right? And you have to just uh, sort that data. So uh, here you can see the swapping procedure is occurring very uh, lesser number of time as compared to the other algorithms of sorting. So the conditions where you have to minimize the number of swaps. And still, you have to just sort the array. Selection sort can perform way better than other algorithms, right? So I hope the logic for the selection sort algorithm is clear to you all. So whenever there is a condition that, uh, as I explained in the earlier example, that there are a lot of uh, data in your uh, disk and you have to do some sorting kind of thing, so there is a condition that uh, you have to minimize the swap. Then selection sort algorithm can perform way better, right? So I hope the, you like the video and. 
uh, we will be continuing our series on this sorting algorithm videos and we will be uploading more videos on these algorithms as well as if you have some specific uh, topics that you wish that we should teach in our youtube channel so please comment down in the comment section and if you like the video then please hit the like button we will meet you in the next video so thank you guys see you next time Hey guys, so today we will understand how merge sort works. Merge sort. So guys, uh, merge sort is one of the most uh, classical sorting algorithms and this is based on one of the most important paradigms of algorithm and that paradigm is called as divide and conquer. Okay, divide and conquer. So first let us understand what divide and conquer is. So basically, let's say if I have got a problem one, okay, whose size is say m, okay. So divide and conquer strategy is that you divide this problem into smaller problems, okay, in the problem uh, into the problems of smaller size. So let's say I divide it into a problem of size n by two and another problem of size n by two. Now, once let's say this sub problem somehow magically gets solved. Once this gets solved, I receive its solution, that is solution one, okay? This also somehow gets solved. So I receive its solution, that is solution two. Once I have got solution one and solution two, that means the divide part of divide and conquer is over, okay? So now I can conquer these solutions and formulate the final solution. So that final part, which leverages solution 1 of sub problem 1 and solution 2 of sub problem 2 and does something on top of it to get the final answer is called as conquer. Okay, so this is the you know very high level explanation of divide and conquer paradigm. Now let's try to correlate this divide and conquer paradigm with our merge sort, that right? how our merge sort leverages it. So let's say I have got an array of size n. So what I would do is I would break this array of size n into two subarrays of size n by 2. Okay. These are two subarrays of size n by 2. And let's say somehow this, this particular uh, subarray gets sorted magically. Okay. So I receive the sorted version of this. Okay. Now this also gets sorted magically. I receive the sorted version of this. So now finally I need to conquer the two sorted portions. This is sorted 1, this is sorted 2. So now somehow, somehow I need to conquer these two sorted portions such that I get the eventually sorted array of the larger problem. Okay, so uh, how do I do that? This conquer thing with respect to merge sort is called as merge procedure. Okay, so what merge procedure does is it receives two sorted arrays and it merges them into final sorted array. Okay, so uh, let us try to understand how merge procedure would actually operate. So um, if I have an array that contains 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now let's say I divide it into two parts 8, 7, 6, and 5 and the other part containing uh, 4, 3, 2, 1. By the time this problem is solved, this portion has become, you know, 5, 6, 7, 8. And this portion has become, by the time this has been solved, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now I need to perform a merge action. I need to perform a merge action so that this gets converted into 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7, 8. So how do I do that? So let's learn about merge procedure. It takes in two sorted arrays. First sorted array is uh, 5, 6, 7, 8 and the second sorted array is 1, 2, 3, 4. It takes two pointers i and j. Okay. Both of them are initially pointing to the first element of both the subarrays and it takes a, an auxiliary array of size equal to size 1 plus size 2 where size 1 is the size of this and size 2 is the size of this. So since there are 8 elements I need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 
Okay, so these I and J pointers are positioned in a way that either of them qualifies to be the current element. So whichever is smaller qualifies to be the current element. So since this is the smaller, one comes here and I move this pointer. Two is smaller than this. Two comes here. I move this pointer. Three is smaller than this. Three comes here. I move this pointer. Four is smaller than this. Four comes here. I move this pointer. Now this array is over. The moment one of the sorted arrays is over and some elements are remaining in the other, that means all the, rem all the remnants of that array are greater than all the elements that, that have been inserted till now. And since this is sorted in itself, it can be uh, pushed as it is in this particular uh, auxiliary array. So it's just a matter of putting them one by one over here. Okay, so I will do five, six, seven. So this is what the merge procedure is. The time complexity of this is order m plus n where m is the size of first sorted array and n is the size of second sorted array because you can see that every element is getting touched only once. Okay, every element is getting touched and pushed only once. So that is the reason. Now, uh, in context of merge sort, let's try to understand how uh, this merge uh, procedure actually operates. So I will take an array, let's say that contains 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2 and 1. So first what I do, I divide it into 8, 7, 6, 5 and 4, 3, 2, 1. I will merge once this problem and this problem has been solved. So first this problem will be solved, right? According to recursion, first this branch has to be solved, then only this would proceed. Now to solve this, again I break it into 8, 7 and 6, 5. And then I perform merge. Merge would be performed when this is sorted and this is also sorted. Now for this, it gets broken into 8, into 7, and then merge would be triggered. Okay. Now see, the moment the two sub arrays are of size one each, no further breaking down can happen. So this is the termination condition. The moment I have reached termination condition, what is termination condition when both the sub arrays are of size one each? So no further calls happen, merge happens. So merge happens, what would happen? That I take an auxiliary array of size two, and as I described, I would get a sorted array 7, 8 in that auxiliary array and then from that auxiliary array I can copy that contents back to here. So if I got a merged auxiliary array like this, I copy this back in the original input. So now this has become 7, 8. So basically this problem has been solved. Similarly same thing happens here. This gets broken to 6, to 5 and then merge kicks in. The moment merge kicks in, it merges them into an auxiliary array and copies the content back over here. So I get 5, I get 6. Now this merge would kick in because for this problem, uh, the half of this has been solved and half of this has been solved. So the next thing is merge. So it merge this and this in an auxiliary array and it would give me 5, 6, 7, 8, which would be copied here and it would become 5, 6, 7, 8. Same thing that happened for this part would also happen for this part and this would get converted to something like 1, 2, 3, 4. Once this is sorted, this is sorted, so the merge of this entire thing would happen and there would be an auxiliary array that would contain 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This entire thing would be copied here and I would get the eventually sorted array as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. So this is how merge sort operates. So if I have to write the you know uh, pseudo code for merge sort, it is simple. Uh, merge sort would take in an array, its start index and end index. Okay. As I told you, the termination condition is size one. So I would make further calls only when the size is not one. It is greater than one. So if i is not equal to j, it indicates that uh, there are more than one element. So in that case, first thing I do is I find the mid, which is i plus j upon 2. And then first I call the merge sort for the left portion, which is from i to m. Then I call the merge sort for 
right portion which is from m plus 1 to j. Once this portion is sorted and this portion is sorted, I call merge of this sorted portion and this sorted portion m plus 1 to j. So this is the pseudo mode for merge sort. Merge procedure you can easily write on your own where a uh, merge procedure would take in starting and ending of one sorted array, so sorted subarray and starting and ending of second sorted subarray and merges them accordingly. So now let's discuss about the time complexity. So you can see that at every level the size is getting halved. So how many levels will be there? In the last level, there is only one element and since this is becoming n to n by 2, n by 4, n by 8 and so on, number of levels would be log of n raised to. And now, in each level, how many operations are happening? So in each level, in the last level, okay, in the last level, there are n elements of size 1 each, okay. In the second last level, there are n by 2 elements of size 2 each. In the third last level, there are n by 4 elements of size 4 each. So I can say that at each level, number of elements are n into 1, that is n, n by 2 into 2, that is n, n by 4 into 4, that is n. So how many merges would happen? Number of merges would be equal to the number of elements. So in each level, order n merge operations are happening. And since there are log n such levels, so overall time complexity would be order n log n. Let's also discuss about the space complexity. Since I told you I need an auxiliary array to temporarily merge and store the contents. Okay, so what would be the size of that auxiliary array? That would be augs of size n. Because at max there would be two subarrays of size n by 2, n by 2 each. To merge them I need an auxiliary array of size n. So that's it, that's about the time complexity and the space complexity. I hope you understood it. That's it. Thank you. Merge sort is, if imagine you had to sort a deck of cards. One possible way, which is by the way also called divide and conquer, could be that I break down this deck of card to half deck of card and half deck of card. So I divide into two parts, right? Like half goes, let's say to the left, half goes to the right. I sort those individually, right? So half deck of cards, I sort them somehow by some magic and right side also I sort somehow by some magic. So now I have two sorted deck of cards, right? I have two sorted deck of cards. Now the problem becomes if I have two sorted deck of cards, can I merge them so that they still remain sorted? Imagine, let me give you an example, right? So let's say I have an array, two, three, five. Let's say I have another array, one, six, eight. If I was given these two arrays, can I merge them into another array, which is completely sorted? Is that possible or not? If that is possible, then this could become another algorithm, which is like whenever I need to sort an array, I can divide into two parts, recursively sort them, and then I can merge them. So merge becomes the important step. Now the question is, I have given you a problem. You have two arrays, not necessarily of the same length. Let's say this is of size A, this is of size B. Can you create another array of size A plus B where all of the elements come from A or B and they're all sorted? Is the question clear? Like you have some A number of arrays in array A, you have B number of elements in array B. Array A and B are individually sorted. So A is a sorted array, B is also a sorted array. You have to merge them into another sorted array. How would you do that? Basically, if I have been given two numbers, let's say I have an array A, two, three, five, and I have an array B, which is, let's say, 1, 4, 8. And I have to create a sorted array, right? Which is of size 3 plus 3, which is 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, correct? This is the eventual sorted array I have to contain or create. One thing is, the first element in the sorted array is going to be the completely minimum of all, everything in the array, right? So given array A is sorted, minimum from array A is on position number 0, correct? Minimum from array B is also on position number zero. So therefore, whichever is the minimum of these two, I don't need to look at any other element. Whichever is the minimum of these two is going to be the first element in the sorted array. Is that something you all agree with? And what is the minimum of these two? Minimum of these two is one. So one comes here. Now, if I have inserted one here, 
and it is as good as saying that now i remove one from b it is the same thing right so what i just do is how do i remove one from b i just change this pointer to now point at this number 4 this is as good as saying that i am now merging two arrays one array which is a and one array which is b but b is starting from this point onwards and i again do the same thing what is the next number that should come here it should be the minimum of numbers here and minimum of numbers here what is the minimum of numbers here array at this pointer what is the minimum of numbers here the array at this pointer whichever is smaller which is 2 comes here and this pointer moves one step forward so in short the approach becomes that you have two pointers let's say there's a pointer 1 which is for array a there's a pointer 2 which is for array b and you just say the following while pointer 1 is less than whatever is the size of a and pointer 2 is less than size of b you do the following you figure out which one is smaller you just check if a of pointer 1 is smaller than equal to b of pointer 2 then simple this is what goes in the sorted array so let's say sorted of let's keep an index a of pointer 1 you increment the pointer 1 plus plus because now pointer 1 has been assigned here else you put pointer 2 element here so sorted of again index plus plus is equal to b pointer 2 pointer 2 plus plus the only thing is when i'm done with this while loop it is possible it is possible that all of the smaller elements were in one of the array imagine like this array was 1 2 3 here and there were let's say 4 5 6 here my pointer 1 will end up going here and i'll end up breaking out where i have only filled in 1 2 3 in the sorted array 4 5 6 is yet to be filled so i'll have to check for that which is at the end of this while loop if whichever pointer is is not done so i just check while pointer 1 is less than size a i just keep adding sorted of index plus plus is equal to a of pointer 1 plus plus and very similarly i do the same thing with pointer 2 while pointer 2 is less than size of b same thing sorted b of pointer 2 plus plus right that will cause the merge to happen does this make sense right now if that can happen which means now if merging can happen and what is the time complexity of this merge imagine i have two arrays of size n and n each n plus n n plus n right like so it takes me order n time to merge if in fact the array a was of size m this was of size n it takes me order of n plus n time right that means if i have a order n array to be sorted if i divide it into two parts i say that sort the first part separately sort the second part separately once they are sorted then merging them will take me order of n by 2 plus n by 2 time which is order n time so merging them will take me order n time now how do i sort the first half of the array i can do the same thing with the first half as well i can say that even to sort the first half again break it down into two parts and then sort the first half sort the second half merge it with the end condition being that once i have an array of only size 1 it is already sorted how about i modify this and i say that i have three arrays that need to be merged right imagine i have a array 2 5 10 imagine there is another array 1 8 9 and imagine there is another array 3 4 12 let's say there were three arrays right how would you merge these three arrays into one array which has all elements are sorted we can do two at a time but we don't necessarily need to right like we look at this right what is the first element going to be in the merged array it is the smallest of all where does the smallest come from it is either the first element from here or the first element from here or the first element from here whichever is the minimum from here that becomes your smallest so i can have three pointers pointer 1 pointing to the zeroth element pointer 2 here pointer 3 here whichever is the smallest of these three which in this case is 1 1 comes here and then all i do is i move this pointer one step to the right and i again repeat the same thing whichever is the smallest of these three which is 2 2 comes here and then 2's pointer moves one step to the right now again 5 8 3 whichever is the smallest 3 is the smallest 3 comes here and 3's pointer moves to the right 5 8 4 4 is the smallest so 4 comes here 
and its pointer moves to the right. 5, 8, 12. 5 is the smallest, so 5 comes here. And 5's pointer moves to the right. And then so forth, right? In the case of merge order, it is only two arrays. An extension of the previous question. Then instead of two, if there were three arrays, how do you go about merging three arrays? I mean, you can merge two arrays at a time. You can merge these two at a time, and then you end up merging these two. But you'll end up using more memory because to merge these two, you'll need an additional array of size six. Then you'll create an array of size nine. What I'm doing is I'm just directly creating an array of size nine so that I reduce the amount of memory required to maintain that intermediate re-array. Also, I reduce a step. Okay, all right. Coming back to the merge sort. How does merge sort work? As the name suggests, it's divide and conquer, which is basically now that I know that I have the superpower of taking two sorted arrays and merging them. What I can do is I given an array A, I sort the first half. So sort A to 0 to n by 2. Sort A of n by 2 plus 1 to n. And then merge these guys. That can become my approach. And this, how do you sort the first half? This also can happen in the same way, where you again divide into two parts, 0 to n by 4, and then n by 4 to n by 2. And again, then you merge, etc., etc. Right? And if I have to write code for this, it becomes fairly simple, which is, let's say, if the array, if the question was, how do you sort array A from index i to index j? If, if obviously like the size of the array is already one, which means if j is equal to i, let, let's just put that, then your array is already sorted. So you can just directly return. If not, then what you do is you basically sort the first half, which is you say, I'll go from a of i to mid, where my mid is i plus j by two. Then I'll sort a from mid plus one to j. And once these two guys are sorted, then I will need a temp array where I'll merge the array from I to mid and mid plus one to J. And then I'll make sure that A of I to J becomes equal to temp. I'll just um, do that. But basically I'm just applying recursion here. And what I'm saying is if you want me to solve by the way, let's say there is there are four numbers, right? Five, three, two, six. Let's say those were the four numbers. I say the first sort the first half. So let me call the function to solve these two numbers, five and three. Somebody sort this and then give it to me and then sort the second half separately. So somebody sort two and six and give it to me. And once I have them sorted, then I will actually merge them, right? Now to sort five and three, I again do the same thing. I split it half. I say somebody sort five for me and somebody sort three for me. Here also and somebody sort two for me and then six for me. Once they are sorted, then I'll merge. Five is sorted, three is sorted. How do I merge? In my merge step, the same way we have, we have seen, we have two arrays, we have to merge. When we merge, this will become three, five. And that is what I replace my original array with. So the, this array becomes three and five. Very similarly, two, six remains two, six. And then once I have three, five and two, six, then I merge them to find two comes first, then comes three, then comes five, then comes six. And this becomes my actual sorted array, which I replace this with. Just out of curiosity, why do we divide them into equal halves? Although in the end, we move to single elements and merge them in sorted order. Can't we take pairs in the array and do the same way of merging? Let's say I have more numbers, right? So imagine I had 5, 6, 8, 1, 2, 13, 15, 12, 3. How many do we have? We have 4. And let's imagine I remove 12 from here. Question is, if we have to sort anyway, why don't we take pairs by pairs, right? So let's, let's just take pair five, six, eight, one, two, 13, 15, three, and let's just first sort them. So we, we end up sorting them. And for example, we end up finding that this is five, six, this becomes one, eight, this is two, 13, and this becomes three, 15, right? Now the problem is like we've done pair by sorting, but the array is still not sorted. Then we'll have to do sorting of four, four elements each, right? How do we do that? We say that, you know what, like there are first four elements here. The first half is sorted. The second half is also sorted. Let's merge somehow, which again, I'll take another array and then I'll merge, etc. So this will get sorted. Then I'll do again the same thing, which is I take four elements, half is sorted, half is sorted, and I'll do the same thing. And then finally, I'll look at all of the eight elements. So you're going just in the reverse order. 
what I just said, you're just going in the reverse order, which is also correct. It's just a harder to code because the previous approach can be coded using recursion, which I'll just show uh, in your approach. What you're doing is you're building bottom up, right? Like you're sort of saying that let's first sort all pair of elements. Once they are sorted, then let's look at all four size elements. Great. Once they are done, then let's look at all eight, eight size chunks. Once they are done, then look at all eight, 16 size chunks and then 32 size and then 64 and so forth. Right? And finally, I'll, I'll have the entire array sorted, which works. It's just harder to code. What I said was the other way around that instead of going from one to two to four to eight and so forth, let's start from N. Let's divide that into n by two parts, then n by four, then n by eight. And I'll finally reach the one part anyway. And then my recursion function will keep returning and I'll have the eventual answer. So if you look here, my recursive function, this will do the same thing. My recursive function here will also do the same thing. Let me also just write it as merge step. So what is happening is if I have an n sized array, I'm dividing it into two arrays of size n by two each, n by two each. I'm sorting it using the same methodology, which is this n by two will create arrays of size n by four, n by four. Here also, again, same n by four, n by four. These will create arrays of size n by eight, n by eight. Again, n by eight, n by eight. Same thing. And this n by 16, n by 16, and so forth. How many levels will you have here? I mean, we go from n to n by two, n by two to n by four, n by eight, four to n by eight, n by eight to n by 16. How many levels? Log n levels, right? So in every level, n is becoming half of what it was. As we have seen the same pattern in binary search, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, as you go, if n is becoming half of what it was, it takes you log n steps to finally come to one. At every step, what is happening? I at every step, basically I have n by two, n by two sorted array. I'm merging them, which takes me order n time. This takes me order n time. n by two plus n by two and order n. What happens on this level? These two guys merge and takes it takes them n by four plus n by four, which is n by two time. These two guys merge and it takes them n by two times. If you add them up, it will take you order n time on this level as well. Very similarly on the other level as well, where you have n by eight, there are eight instances of n by eight. It will again take you order n time. So the total time taken on every level, it takes you order n time. There are log n levels. The total time taken is n log n. That is an intuitive way to understand. I can also explain the mathematical way of explaining this. But the intuitive way of understanding the time complexity of merge sort is that on every level, you're doing one merge. The merge is order n. Number of levels is log n. And therefore, in fact, if you look at Arvind's approach, if you were to implement it, in every iteration, what you're doing is you're first creating pairs and you're merging the pairs takes you order n time. Then you're looking at all four, four blocks, right? Like blocks of four each in one order n operation, you will have sorted blocks of four each. Then in again, one order n operation, you would have sorted blocks of eight, eight each. And you'll keep doing that till you cover the entire array. So the number of steps to cover the entire array would be log n and every single iteration is an order n iteration. So it takes you an order of n log n. I can explain the math behind it as well. Is it n log n in every case? Best case is sure. I mean, you can probably put an optimization there that if the array is already sorted, if a half is already sorted, you don't need to do all of the splitting, etc. So best case, you can still make order n. But yes, worst case is order n log n. Worst case, it takes you order n log n. And you can put a check to make sure that you're not doing the entire splitting, etc. If the array is already sorted. All right. What is the space complexity of merge sort? So if you look at the implementation here, we are allocating this additional memory temp to calculate this merged part, right? Why? Because when we are merging to sorted arrays, we need this temporary space where we put in the result, which is not a part of the original array. This is additional space. If I have to look at this tree in this n by two part, I would have taken a temp array, which was of size n by two. Here, I would have taken a temp array, which was of size n by two. In fact, let's look at total space allocation, right? So this n by two will make a call to n by four, eight, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this is a log n stack memory space plus in each of these. So imagine I was sorting this array of size n, this will end up calling for n by two. This will end up calling for n by four n by eight and so forth. In each of this, I would have a temp array allocated, which will be freed as long as, I mean, I fill it back, right? So this temp array here is of size n by four. As soon as I'm done, then this will be freed. 
then I come back here. Here it will be of size, additional size of n by 2. As soon as I'm done, it will be freed. And then I'll come back here and I'll have a temp area additional size n. So maximum space that I end up using additional is I have log n stack of recursion plus I have this additional order n size array that I might have used, which is my temp array. So order n extra space is what we end up using apart from the array space. So space complexity becomes order n. Time complexity becomes order of n log n. There's one more way to, by the way, calculate time complexity. I mean, if you assume that the time taken for sorting an array of size n is tn, then tn is nothing but I'm saying first sort array, first half of the array, then sort second half of the array, which is also of size n by two, and then merge them, which is it takes you some n time. Let's say, let's say it takes you n time. This is basically saying two times t n by two plus n, right? If you break it down further, your n by two is two times t n by four plus n by two, which is the same as four times t n by four plus two n, which you'll see will finally come to two to the power i t times n by two to the power i plus n into i. I mean, this is just a little mathematical. Therefore, I explain the intuitive way first, which I mean, if you want this to become equal to one, I becomes log n. So you have n into t times one plus n into log n, which is n log n. This is what how master's theorem actually works. Uh, I'm just elaborating that, expanding the, that equation. Even if you don't know about master's theorem, that is fine. As long as you understand the intuition of why it is n log n. Because in the recursion tree, there are log n levels. On every level, I'm using order n time. Right? So time complexity becomes order of n log n. Space complexity becomes order of n. Uh, is there any way without using the extra space? Uh, so actually merging two sorted arrays without using extra space in order n is not possible. That becomes the, the blocker, right? So if you can merge the array in place without using extra memory, then your problem would have been sorted. But the problem is like merging without extra memory is, is the issue. All right, does this make sense? Merge, sort, space complexity, time complexity, all of that. All right. If you like the video, please do not forget to like, comment and share this video with all your friends. Also, subscribe to our channel to get notified about the new upcoming videos.